kind of a hack at everything. I don't really, I'm not really an expert technically in, uh, in any field, uh, but I read a lot and I have a lot of interests. And um, this is kind of a, a bit of a tangent, but uh, I have a little toy that is actually going on right now. Um, it's uh, broadcasting a Wi-Fi network uh, that says Tony Grimes. And uh, it's kind of a test. It's like uh, just kind of a proof of concept kind of thing. And if you log into that Wi-Fi network and go to any web page, uh, you should hopefully go to um, some information about me. It goes to my blog and uh, my Facebook thing and uh, a bunch of other stuff. And uh, since there's uh, so many nerdy, nerdy people out there, uh, I invite you to, uh, to hack the shit out of me. Um, this is kind of like a real test. It's got a 3G network, so um, our connection. So feel free to saturate my uh, my data plan and uh, see if you can break it because uh, this is really the only kind of setting that I can really do this. So um, uh, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, yeah. morality. So uh, one of the things that I like doing is uh, just kind of thinking about uh, the world today and all the crap in it and how to fix it. Probably a lot of the same things that you guys uh, think about. And um, one of my goals is to kind of tr try and find a way to add a little bit of compassion into the world, uh, especially, but not specifically in the, in the corporate sector. Uh, you know, there's lots of uh, CEOs who just kind of see the, a need for more profits, uh, that kind of stuff. And they do like these massive layoffs, and they do all these other atrocious things that I'm not going to get into because it's uh, really depressing. But um, a lot of the thing, one of the things that I uh, really like. Uh, researching and reading about is uh, neurocognitive psychology and uh, paleobiology and sociology. And uh, my kind of personal belief is that one of the big problems that in uh, our society today is that the environment that we're living in right now is um, crazy, crazy different than the way that we evolved in. And I think a lot of these problems that we're experiencing are, aren't really problems, but really uh, symptoms of an underlying problem, of a, a really a breakdown of community. Uh, if you read a lot of Peter Block and, and McKnight, uh, you get a lot of that stuff. Um, so what I wanted to do today was just kind of, just do a, a little um, psychological experiment, um, just a, a thought experiment, I guess, on morality, and, and maybe come up with some ideas on, on how we can you know, just change things around, think about life differently, you know, go about our daily business uh, a little differently, but hopefully make a little bit of change one bit at a time. So uh, what this is, is uh, it's called the trolley problem. Uh, it's something that uh, philosophers, uh, actually it goes way back to Aristotle, but this is the most current version that's been uh, floating around for the last uh, 30, 40 years. And uh, it's, um, I guess a morality problem in that uh, you get to choose whether or not you kill one person to save five. And it's done in two scenarios. Uh, and the first one, oh, that's very laser. So, you're walking down 7th Ave. You're uh, going down along the, uh, the C train. And you notice that uh, some asshole has tied up a bunch of people on the tracks. And you notice there's a train coming down, and this, let's say this is the track going to Sunnyside. This one's just regular 10th Street. And um, you realize that this train is a Crawford train. If you do nothing, it's going to run over five people, and they're going to die. But as luck would have, luck would have it, you're walking by a little switcher thing, and it has to be unlocked, and you know, just right there, instructions on how to use it, all of that. And you realize that if you pull this lever, uh, you can send it down a sidetrack where it only kills one person. And uh, this is uh, kind of, uh, 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 I guess, where the participation comes in. This isn't actually the problem, but let's all put our hand up, right hand up. Just, uh, we'll st stretch it up, get ready for the DJs. Maybe if you're a lefty, do the lefty. And we need uh, everyone to put up their hand, so everybody look left and right and look at their neighbor and look, give a really guilty, guilty, like, mean look for the people who don't have their hands up. <laughs> Come on, let's get a little peer pressure going. Yeah. All right, now remember that, muscle memory. Remember that, that motion. So I'm posing this question to you guys. How many here would pull the lever to kill one person to save five people? And this is actually my vote, so. All right. Great. And uh, how many people wouldn't pull the lever? lever? They would just kind of let it go, close their eyes, run down the street. Save the one person and not, or, oh, never mind, I get it. Oh, and, 
<laughs> I forgot to tell you, this is like pure q and A's wide open. I'm just pushing the Q&A section right into this. So if you have any questions on, uh, you know, any... This, <laughs> this, yeah, this isn't really like a Mensa question. You, you can't really like, uh, I don't know, put a pebble on the track or something like that. It's just one of those like binary kind of things. You have to pull it or you don't. Um, <laughs> so, well, why don't we, we'll just uh, go to the uh, second scenario, shall we? So, pretty much the same scenario, uh, logically the same. It's a uh, kill one to save five. But this time, you are on a pedestrian bridge. <laughs> looking at the train tracks. And now your choice is to, you're just overlooking it, and you realize if you do nothing, five people will die, and there's a stranger standing next to you. On the <laughs> and your, your choice is, uh, is rather simple, really, if you think about it. Um, do you push that person? If you, you realize if you push them off, they're like perfectly, perfectly positioned for some reason, and they'll fall on the tracks, stop the train. I uh, remember somebody saying, stop the train, well, now's your chance. And it will save the five people. So uh, remember the uh, muscle memory. Okay, so wait, wait, oh. isn't there a third option though? Uh, this one, there's only two. But could it, your body also stop the train if you can jump off it? Oh yeah. Yeah, that just means you don't push, so you get put into the non-pushing bucket. It's uh, you, you can totally jump yourself. You, you know, jump yourself. You can uh, you can do all sorts of things. It really just it's kind of like a none of the above is included in the non-pushing. So. The, uh, so now, no, here, okay, so here we go. Um, hands up if you would push the person to save five people. So, so yeah, it, 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 is a, it, is a, it is a stranger. It is a stranger. But uh, inter interesting that that question pops up quite a lot, and even more interestingly, uh, it never pops up during the first scenario. It's uh, one of those things where, um, just judging by your hands, there's a lot less people that would uh, that would not be willing to push the person. And over the last, I don't know, three or four decades, this is a very, very well studied problem uh, in psychology uh, and in philosophy. And um, the results are very consistent. Uh, it turns out that there's a maybe nine out of ten people will pull the lever, but only one out of ten people will push the person. And even though logically this is uh, really the same math, and uh, there's a couple versions so that you know the philosophers can like nitpick over you know philosophical details and stuff. And I don't really um, care about that stuff really. Um, they've been kind of going over and over. It kind of turns into a religious debate after a while, like not technically religious, but. Um, Really, over through 20 or 30 years, what they've uh, found is that there's a general consensus of what the fuck? We don't know. Uh, there's really no point. Um, except uh, today, like in the 80s and 90s and, and in the last decade, we've had uh, huge advances in, in uh, neuroimaging. So we can actually look inside the brain as people are deciding and going through this experiment. And uh, very interesting. Uh, well, I guess I uh, had a, Can somebody go back? I don't know if I can go back on this one. So, okay. Oh no, I think it turned off the remote. Can uh, somebody advance it? Right here? Right. So how long has that brain one been up? Does everyone memorize it by now? No? Okay, well anyway, it doesn't matter. So, um, Really what they found is that uh, there's actually two different parts of the brain that are uh, they're actually uh, firing uh, in those two scenarios. Uh, in scenario one, when you're, uh, when you're hitting the, uh, the lever, um, the, I guess you didn't really see it, but there's a frontal cortex. Uh, this is like actually the, uh, the oldest or the newest part of the brain. Uh, there's actually there's an oversimplification, but there's kind of two brains uh, inside each of your heads. Um, there's the old part. There's uh, actually the lizard brain, which is actually pretty cool, but I'm not going to talk about it. The, uh, but there's this uh, inner chimp, the, uh, the part of the brain that's actually the same for uh, all land mammals, and especially primates. And it's the part that has uh, uh, deals with emotion, memory, uh, it's the limbic system, uh, endocrine system, all that kind of stuff. And what they found was that in, um, in scenario two, that was the one that actually gets lit up. So right here is the emotional center of the brain. Um, BA stands for uh, some smart guy's area. And uh, over here 
is the uh, kind of like the math, the nerd part of the brain. It's, uh, I call it the outer Spock. It's, uh, it's the newest part. It's the part of the brain that you know, sends people to the moon. It uh, comes up with abstract theories, philosophy, poetry. Well, not poetry. That's a different part. But um, just some of the really, really crazy shit that we think of every day comes from that part of the brain. And um, that's the part of the brain that's actually pulling the lever all the time. And, uh, and it does it without emotion. It, that's why it's kind of like the spot part. And the part in, the, in scenario two is actually done with the emotional centers of the brain. It's actually the oldest part of the brain when uh, we used to be in trees and um, we, were, we came from a, from a place in a time when our survival depended greatly on the people who were spatially closest to us. So um, that's one of the, the main theories here is that it, it actually engages our emotions when uh, somebody actually has close proximity to us and we have to um, actually think a lot harder about uh, what we're sacrificing and who we're sacrificing for any given cause. And um, the, uh, the way, I, like, why does this matter? You know, like, uh, it, right now this is all theory, it's just a hypothetical situation. Um, but uh, one of the interesting things about this is that uh, it not only happens in thought, but it, it happens based on our sight. Um, there's a, another part of our brain called the, called the fusiform gyrus. Uh, it's about the size of a plum, maybe. And uh, this, uh, in general consensus is that this part of the brain um, is pretty much the most sophisticated piece of software known in the known universe. And what it does is it recognizes faces and body types. Uh, there's a huge amount of processing that, does, that goes on automatically as soon as a member of our own species comes within line of sight uh, of us. And that uh, kind of flips our brain modes uh, from Spock mode to chip mode. And um, it, it just kind of... My argument is that it, it kind of makes us more compassionate as a, as a person or as a, as a community, uh, as a species, when we're in the company of others. And there's actually like a, a physiological basis for this. And I find that uh, very interesting. And um, I kind of extrapolate it more towards uh, really the, kind of remember the good old days that we never got to see what you see in movies. Like you, you go to the, the uh, butcher shop and the owner is actually the person behind the counter uh, chopping up your food. Uh, a restaurant or a bar is actually staffed by the owners of the establishment. And, uh, but today we get, um, let's see if it works now. This was uh, actually a failed experiment. It doesn't run on this computer. But uh, this is kind of the world that we live in right now, where uh, the, the scope of our um, society, of everything that we do, uh, globalization, has uh, extended to the point where it's actually beyond our eyesight. And, and the only way that we can actually uh, get a grasp of all the things that are going on in our world today has to be boiled down to a number. And numbers are the domain of the upper spot. So what we've done is uh, we come into day-to-day -day decisions uh, that only activate the, the, the outer spot part of our brain. We're just constantly pulling levers every day, in day, day in, day out. We uh, go buy a mutual fund, we pick the highest number. We go shopping for a mutual, or uh, for a mortgage, we pick the lowest number. And it goes all the way up, that's the, you know, when we're actually a stakeholder in a, in a company where we're buying stocks online, we're actually telling these CEOs that that is what is important to us. So, you know, greed aside, you know, I have a lot of theories on that, um, those CEOs are really just doing what we do on a daily basis. You know, we go to Ikea because it's cheaper. Um, we go to, you know, McDonald's because it's better. Well, you guys go to McDonald's, but, you know, some people go to McDonald's because it's faster, it's just, uh, you know, easier uh, part of our day, and we're constantly pulling these levers. And uh, that's why I'm a little bit, I'm, um, I'm a kind of a, you know, half-assed localist right now, but I'm hoping to be a uh, very uh, strict localist. Uh, soon, and what I would like to have is a um, just a world that's more like this. Who recognizes these uh, fine folks? These guys. This is uh, Amber and McLean. They uh, they work at the Hoffman Group, and uh, this is a locally owned bar by uh, by Dick. And uh, you'll know Dick when you seem to come in here because he's walking around and never smiles, and he's the one who tells you to uh, you know do a bunch of stuff and don't smoke there. Bunch of other stuff, and uh, he's actually in this photo, but it turns out he can't be photographed, which is weird. But the um, going back to uh, like what I want to use this as an example of is is uh, about six, three or four years ago, uh, Intel like laid off 
something like 700 or 7,500 employees uh, because they needed to stabilize their profits. They were still making a profit, but they saw fit to uh, fire over 7,000 people. And, and it ended up being around 10,500. 10% uh, 10 of the workforce was actually let go or, or sold off. Uh, that's the amount of uh, people in my hometown. You know, like they, they essentially fired a town. And one of the things I find interesting is that uh, that CEO, you know, he was just signing a paper, you know, just looking at some graphs and, you know, like looking at salaries and stuff. And he was just pulling that lever. And I realized that, uh, that Dick can't do that. You know, like he, he can't just pull that lever. He actually has to push one of these two people out. Every time he fires somebody, he has to make a choice. And it has to be a hard choice. And I think that's what I love about uh, localism. And, and I, I do have a lot of hope for, uh, you know, I'm depressed all the time because of all the stuff that goes on, but um, I have a lot of hope for it, mainly because of technology, like especially Protospace. I'm a director of Protospace, and it's, um, I'm a non-institutionalist. I, I hate institutions, I hate meetings, I hate any kind of bureaucracy, all of that. And um, Protospace is the one organization I've loved enough to actually sign up to be a director. And the reason why I did that is because they're working with stuff that actually makes it feasible for people to start, we're kind of, I guess the way I like to look at it is uh, the Industrial Revolution kind of got us here today. It's been, you know, it's pretty, worked out pretty well with for us, you know, like we got a pretty standard, high standard of living. But I think in the next 10, 20 years, especially with the internet, uh, you get 3D printers. Um, I, I've got an bot that I, I take out to farmers markets and stuff, and, and people love it. And I think we're on the verge of, uh, I don't know what it's going to be called, I'm calling it the, uh, the personal revolution, where we actually will have the power of personal fabrication. And it might not be as cheap as, uh, as what we're doing right now, but you know, it's going to be a lot cooler. You know, we'll be able to actually go just down the street and ask our neighbor because he's got, you know, some, you know, magic piece of machinery that'll turn out a table. And it can be actually personalized with your other neighbor's art. You know, it'll actually engrave it, it'll do some, you know, some kind of six axis CNC milling kind of thing. And you'll be actually be able to take it home and actually be proud of the objects that you were, uh, that you have in your life. You'll actually have more of a connection. When things break, you know, they'll be too important to, to throw away. You, you'll, you'll actually know how to fix it, hopefully. Or if you don't, you'll know somebody who can't fix it. And you can mod it, you can hack it, you can upgrade it, you can do all this stuff. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think uh, Protospace is, is that one. Um, I think the, the biggest thing that I've, I've seen in the city uh, so far in, in just reskilling society and actually introducing people and, and, and giving people a, a greater connection to the, uh, to the things around them. And at the same time, creating a smaller world where a lot of our decisions, uh, the consequences happen right outside your door. So you actually do have a great chance of running into uh, the, uh, the good sides and the downsides of the decisions you make in your everyday life. Uh, I guess that's all I had to say. Uh, questions? I guess. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's there's overgeneralization. Like they're they're all both lit up, um, but by a far significant uh, margin of error, uh, the emotional center is lit up with the pushing. And the lever pulling is the frontal cortex. So all it is, all it's doing is really just doing math. And um, when in the pushing part, it's also doing the math, but it's weighing it against the emotions of the situation. Yeah, it's completely flipped. Yeah, nine out of ten would pull the lever. One out of ten would push the person. And it's been replicated a lot, so it's uh, it's a pretty pretty consistent finding. Yeah, well. There's a, like, I, I've been doing, this, once you get into cognitive neuroscience, it's kind of like a big rabbit hole. And you run into, like, sociology and stuff. And um, there's a theory, it hasn't been tested yet, uh, nobody's been able to figure out how. Um, and the, the theory is that you are the average of the five people that are closest to you. Uh, your roommates, uh, the family that you hang out with the most, uh, you name it. And uh, one of the patterns that I, I've found in uh, economics 
is that it's a very close system right down from, well, you guys all know if you've seen Zeitgeist and uh, there's a couple of others, um, where it's a close system from education all the way to business to politics in that the, and actually we're, we're victims of it as well, in that uh, one of the uh, side effects of free energy, of all this cheap energy that we've had, is that we've been able, is mobility. We've been able to travel farther and farther away from home. Whereas like in the, uh, the Little House on the Prairie scenario, uh, you were stuck. You, had, you lived within 25 miles of your home your entire life. You had to live with your neighbors. You had to get along with them. But with all this mobility, we're allowed to just move beyond. And if you don't like your neighbors, you don't have to talk to them. You just drive to the other end of the city. You can go to uh, places like this. And what I think it's creating is, is kind of a monoculture of interest, where uh, we've become uh, very intolerant of ideas that are different from our own. And you see that in our in our uh, group. Um, you know, like who here drives a truck? You know, who actually likes people who drive trucks? You know, the big, huge, loud ones. You know. And uh, I personally do. I'm a I'm a recovering head coach from Brooks. And um, but when you get into economics, you know, they're a very close society in that. Um, there's only one way of thinking, and all of those thoughts, uh, if you take that, uh, that average of five people, they all think the same way, and, and you, you, you get a lack of diversity. And when, no matter what context you're talking about, when it comes to diversity, diversity is good. You have know, the most diversity. So just for you guys, like, um, if you have a lot of friends, that's great, but if they all, all think the same way, that's bad. Uh, you you got to start mixing. And um, I... Just try, it's hard, you know, it's pretty hard not to judge people based on your values. Uh, but you know what, like, uh, Michael Landon had to get along with that, uh, that bitch behind the, uh, the butcher bar, you know, that uh, little racist uh, lady, I can't remember her name. And he, he was, she was married by, uh, to that, oh, that poor bald guy. And, uh, you know, we, it's, it's hard, but you know what, it's, there's a lot, of, a lot to be said about debate, you know, healthy debate. And now it's just yelling at each other. You know, and I think we have to dial that back. Anything else? I was just going to yep. say the uh, the question you posed with the train pushing scenario or whatever um, has been reframed by people smarter than me. They're basically asking somebody with five hundred dollars Gucci shoes on whether they ruin those shoes to go save a drowning baby. And ten, almost ten times out of ten, they say yes, of course I would. <laughs> but if they were to reinvest that money instead of purchasing their shoes putting that money in the hands of an effective uh, charitable organization, they'd be saving hundreds if not thousands of babies by, that, by spending that money that way instead of buying those shoes in the first place. So it's basically the same ethical question reframed that you know what right do you have to buy those fucking shoes when you know that that same money could have been spent to save 500 if not 1,000 babies. But of course I'd have to save that driving baby. Of course I would, because I'm a good person. You know? Yeah, yeah, I, there, you can go, that's the rabbit hole when you get into this philosophical stuff. And all I would I would say is, is I would ask, okay, uh, how expensive are the shoes? Did you buy them local? And can you get them fixed? You know, like uh, I like I buy these shoes at all these places, and you know I get holes in all my shoes. I'm a I'm a big walker, and I take them to uh, this uh, this cobbler guy, the guy in the, by the Starbucks in TD Square, and I just show him the shoes. He just like. You know, he doesn't speak very good English, and uh, he just now like, get the fuck out of this. You know, they would just, it would melt or something. I don't know what would happen. But uh, now I finally found some like rock quartz. Rock quartz are awesome. They're like fifteen dollars to fix. And uh, you know what? There's something to be said for for five hundred dollars shoes. You know, it's uh, if anything, I, I wish we would spend more money on things rather than uh, than less. It's also kind of the inverse of those first like the weaver pulling issue. Anything else? All right. Uh, I declare this a dance party. Thank you very much.